Hi and welcome to Hope for Easter. My name is Richard, I'm one of the pastors at Wood Green Evangelical Church in Worcester and I'm joined today by my good friend Ryan Mulliet who's part of our church family and who's going to be sharing how the message of Easter gave him hope in the midst of tragedy. Ryan thank you so much for being willing to share your story with us today. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to us, why don't you you share a little bit about yourself, are you married, have you got kids? Okay, thanks Richard. Um, well, yeah, my name's Ryan. I, um, I'm married to the lovely Sarah and uh, we have two lovely daughters. We have Libby, who's five, going on 35. And we have um, uh, Florence, who's two, and she's our, um, she's our stick of dynamite at the moment. Um, at the moment, I'm a part-time student studying social sciences at the college. And um, apart from being a, uh, a help around the house and looking after the children, I also work part time as a, I guess you'd call it a manual laborer. I work for a friend who um, turns steel into beautiful garden furniture. So, yeah, I kind of stay out of the way while he does that, but that's where I'm at. Great. Now, now um, you're a Christian, so Easter is a big deal for you. Uh, a friend of mine once described Easter Sunday as the cup final day for Christians. Um, explain to us, why is Easter special to you? Why is the message of Easter special to you? And has it always been like that for you? Yeah, yeah, Easter is a really big deal to me and it is a big deal to Christians, but I think it's such a big deal that it's, it's a big deal for anyone with a pulse, anyone that's alive. I, it, Easter, I mean, something happened 2000 years ago on this planet that just changes everything. It, it proves so much incredible stuff. It proves that there is a God. It proves that he, he's a God who wants to know us, who loves us. It proves that heaven and hell are real places. It proves that there's life after death and it proves that we can live this life before the grave and after the grave with hope. And um, it's all resting on the fact that Jesus, God's son, conquered death. He died and he rose again three days later. And so, you know, that's, that's the greatest day in history. How can it not be? Um, did I always believe that? I grew up, uh, my mum became a Christian when I was two. She took me to church. I'd learn all the stories about Jesus. But I don't think it hit home until I was about 10 years old. Um, my grand died and I had an opportunity to go and see the body with my mum. So I went, I don't know what I was expecting, but I went and it for the first time, I went toe to toe with the, with the horrible reality and inevitability of death. And um, I felt lots of things, but the thing I felt even more than sadness was um, an overwhelming sense of um, helplessness and of fear. You know, the help, help, helplessness came from just knowing there was nothing I could do to to make my grand respond to me. I, I, you know, I couldn't reach out to her, she couldn't reach out to me. But then the fear of knowing, that's gonna happen to my loved ones, that's gonna happen to my mum, to my dad, to my sisters, to my family, friends, it's gonna happen to me. And um, during that time, I don't know exactly when the penny dropped, the Easter story struck home and I, and I began to realize that death is just one of the many consequences of what the Bible describes as sin turning our backs on God, rejecting him. And, um, and I knew I was a sinner, I was 10 years old, but you give me the Ten Commandments and I knew that, you know, I, I was coming short by a, by a long chalk there. So um, I also realized that God, the God who am I offended with my sins still loves me. And he sent Jesus to come and save me, to, to take the blame and the punishment for my sin. 
um, so that I could have forgiveness and peace with God. And um, I asked him to forgive me, to look after me, to help me, to lead me, to pick me up when I fall. And here I am 35 years on, and that's exactly what he's been doing. And so your friend who described it like cup final day, I'll just go a little bit better. I'm a Liverpool fan. Cup final days do not fill me with hope right now, you know? Um, in every cup final, someone loses. But imagine being in a cup final where even before kickoff, the team's name has been engraved on the cup. You know you're on the winning side. That's what Easter is for me. Yeah, a really big deal. That's great. That, that's really helpful. Um, now, we're, we're thinking particularly about hope for Easter um, today. So um, you're married to Sarah. Sarah's your second wife. Um, you were married to Annie, and Annie died of cancer, I think it's about eight years ago now. Um, so your, your, what you've just shared about the, the message of Easter and bringing hope, how, how does that relate to what happened to you um, with, with Annie? So tell us a bit about her, how you met, what she was like, um, and how the cancer started to emerge. Yeah, um, about 20 years ago now, just over 20 years ago, I first met Annie at a um, Christian youth conference up in Leicester. She lived in London, I lived and I've always lived in Worcester. So we saw each other for the first time then, kind of, um, you know, good friends. Kept in touch for the following year through letters and didn't have social media then. So it was letters and an emails. Man. You're an old man, right? Yeah, I'm a very old man. And um, you could, I had a, a phone company called OneTel and you could, after six o'clock, you could call for a penny a minute. So we would, we would, do it the old-fashioned way. And then the second time I saw her was at the same conference a year later. Um, we met again, and um, long story short, we were engaged in, the, the, in that summer of 2000, and we were married in August 2001 here uh, um, at Wood Green Church. Um, from 2000, um, after 2001, uh, what, what can I tell you uh, between the years before she got cancer? One thing we both loved, we both loved serving the teenagers at the church where we were at. We loved being involved in, in youth work. And in 2006, an opportunity came, came up for me to go and maybe study, get some training in the United States. Um, Annie had family in the States, so it was all very exciting, and, and we pushed that door. And uh, the f from 2006 to 2007, everything fell into place. Uh, have you ever played that game Tetris? Yeah. And you're on a roll when all the blocks are just coming in and they're just you're sweeping up. Um, Everything was falling into place. My employer I worked for gave me voluntary severance, um, which was really helpful. Um, the college accepted me. The church that I was at offered to help with funding. Um, some friends wanted to look after our place for the year, which was brilliant. We had someone to rent the place who we trusted. We had a lovely property to live in next to the college. Some retired missionaries were going back to the mission field for a year, and that was just amazing. And also, um, Annie and I had found out by that time we weren't able to have children. And there was this international adoption agency right next to the college. And we both thought that would be a wonderful thing to push the door of. And they had a, a, you know, a, a meeting set up for us. And it was all very exciting. One week we before, before we were due to fly out to the States, everything started to fall apart. Um, Annie had gone to the hospital just to pick up some results for a routine checkup. Um, I noticed she was gone for some time, but I didn't really think anything of it. I was just tidying up the house, getting it ready before we went. And I got this phone call, and in 15 seconds, everything changed. And uh, it was a nurse at the other end of the phone, and she just said, um, you need to come to the hospital. Your wife needs you to be with her right now. Uh, and I got there, and that's when you know, they led me down a corridor into a small room, and that's when I, we found out that um, Annie had suspected breast cancer. Um, and, uh, you know, suddenly life goes from a dream to a nightmare. Um, the trip to the States was cancelled, obviously. Um, we found out within a few days or weeks that she had actually aggressive uh, form of breast cancer, stage three, very advanced. Um, shortly after that, she had a double mastectomy. Um, uh, and then six months of um, pretty aggressive chemo and radiotherapy. So that takes you up to the point. Um. Now, I mean, Ryan, a lot of people faced with that would have turned their back on God. Um, how, how did you respond to that news? How did you respond to that kind of 
timeline that you just laid out for us. How did Annie respond? Um, how did you make sense of what was going on as a Christian? Hmm. That's a good question, yeah. Um, do you know, I think, I don't know if you uh, have found this, I think some people look at Christians and that Christians get accused of looking at life through rose-tinted glasses. I don't know if you've ever experienced yeah, yeah. that. Um, and um, what I first wanted to say is how important it is for me to be brutally honest. You know, if you or your loved one gets into the ring with cancer, you're going to take those glasses off really quickly or they're going to get knocked off. Really, There's no room for rose-tinted glasses. So to be brutally honest, firstly, it totally knocked us for six. You know, I was absolutely gutted. Not gutted that we weren't going to America. I, I didn't think about that again. Just gutted that this was happening to us, happening to Annie. Um, I remember seeing these posters around at the time, uh, cancer awareness posters, and I found them really insulting. And um, I'll spare you the language, but they said something like, let's kick cancer's backside. You, you probably know what I'm getting at and what the poster actually said. It said something like that. And I, I found that so insulting because from where we were sitting, cancer was kicking us all over the place, you know? Um, cancer's a horrible disease and the treatment of it can be brutal. You know, not everyone has the same experience. Some people go through the treatment really well, but the dose that Annie was getting, it was, it was a really big dose. And there were times when um, I think we both thought she just might die in treatment. You know, it was so rough the nausea and the sleepless nights and and then of course later stages when the cancer got got to her bones and her lungs just watching your wife cry out in agony mm -hmm. before the morphine kicks in is just um as a husband you just sat there and you feel i'm not kicking cancer's butt it's mm -hmm. it's kicking me and there's nothing i can do you know I'm, and it was heartbreaking it was um you feel helpless so that's the first thing i want to say it did knock me for six knocked us both for six but in the spirit of honesty, it totally drew us nearer to God. Um, there's a promise in the Bible that God makes. And he says to Christians, all things that, life, that happen in life, all these things um, work together for the good of those who love God according to a purpose that he, that he has for us. And that was really the theme tune to our lives for the following six years. Um, in fact, I remember right at the beginning after we came out of that hospital the first day, um, uh, we, we were shell-shocked, we were silent. We walked out, we walked to the, if you know the Worcester Hospital, there's an old tree towards the end by the roundabout and we stood there and we just hugged and we cried. And I remember I prayed, um, probably the most profound prayer I've ever prayed really. We just said, Lord, we don't know why this is happening but we trust you and we know you know what you're doing. And in a sense, it felt like we were on plan B. You know, America wasn't happening. This was a very different path, but actually from God's perspective, it was plan A all the way. He was in control. Cancer surprised us, but it didn't surprise him and he was gonna use that experience. So that was really, um, that was really stabilizing um, for, for both of us, really. So if you were to sum up, what, what do you think what was the difference that being a Christian made when you got Annie's terminal diagnosis then? You shared a little bit about the raw kind of immediate experience that you had. Obviously that was followed by weeks and months of um, deterioration. Um, what, did, what difference did it make actually being a Christian in that, in that, that scenario? Yeah, um, there's a thousand ways I could answer that question. I've been thinking about that question this week knowing it was coming. Um, I'd start by saying we both believed uh, and I believe that as I said God has a purpose for suffering and I think one of those purposes and there's lots of purposes I think one of them is for him to take us into a valley to teach us things about himself that are going to change our lives for the better once we get to know those things about him. And, and they're things that we could learn at any point in life, but often I found when life's going really well, I'm not really interested. When there's money in the bank, when health's good, when everyone's doing well, you, we don't get to learn, we don't stop to listen and to look and to learn um, about these things that God wants to show us. So uh, hundreds of differences. Um, in fact, we started keeping a blog in from 2011 when she got a terminal diagnosis. We wanted that really to just be a window 
into our lives at the time to show people honestly what it was like, what difference God made um, as, we'll, as we were going through cancer with, with Jesus. Now, is, that, is, that, is that blog still available for people to read? It is, yeah. I haven't updated it. I, I, I really drew it to an end in 2014 or 15, but it's still there. It's called Broken Chariots, um, and it was based on a, a, a psalm in the Bible, um, brokenchariots.com. So that's still there. But I suppose the biggest um, difference was that we lived with hope. But for me, once Annie had died, I, I grieved with hope. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that says to Christians, you know, when we lose our loved ones who belong to Jesus, we grieve. I mean, I didn't do much crying before Annie died, to be honest. I think maybe that's the brave face thing and, and shell shock. But after she'd gone, I mean, I, I, I did enough crying for a lifetime, you know. Um, but I grieved with hope. I, I think everyone, in the face of death, everyone is looking for a way to cope with the horrible reality of death, the, the loss, the pain, the, the inevitability. And some people joke about it, don't they? Some people laugh. That's their way of coping. Um, that's how uh, they're able to deal with it. Um, I remember, remember someone saying, Woody Allen said, I'm not scared of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> Um, and that's some people look at it. Some people are quite philosophical and stoical about it and they try to accept the finality. And that's how they would say it's making a difference to them. And, um, and I think a lot of people are quite just optimistic, crossed fingers, hope it all works out for the best. But the thing that made a difference to me was my coping strategy was built on rock solid hope. Um, because Jesus is the only person in history who is qualified to talk to me about God because he is the son of God. He's the only person qualified to talk to me about death and about what happens afterwards. And Easter reminds me, you know, he, that's, the, that's the exclamation mark. He's conquered death. And um, that makes a tremendous difference. And I think when, when Annie died, to put that into real terms, um, the difference it made was knowing that it was the end of a chapter, but it wasn't the end of the story. Um, Annie knew, even two or three days before she died, she was a person who knew where she was going. And she was looking forward to leaving this life of pain and cancer and all those things. And she knew she was going to be with Jesus, which was better by far. So that, gave me, that made a big difference to me, as you're the, as you're the, the loved one looking on, um, to see your loved one comfort, comforted and assured makes a big difference, a huge difference. Um, and I also know that one day, whenever that day comes, I'm going to be in that same place because of what Jesus has done. I am going to see her again. Even greater, I'm going to see Jesus, you know. Um, but then it's not just something in the far future. The difference it makes, it, it makes a difference now and forever. And the difference it makes now is that same Jesus who's with Annie in heaven is with me now. Once Annie died, I, I still had lots of questions, and I still have lots of questions that I can't answer. In fact, just yesterday, I went up to the grave. It, it marked, yesterday was um, exactly eight years since Annie died and went to be with Jesus. And um, I went to the grave, and I noticed that there's a new plot next to her, and there was a plaque. Um, someone had just been buried there recently, last year. And when I looked, it was a, a dear lady who lived to 99 and um, it just reminded me again of one of those questions that used to still rings around in my head why does why does God allow some people to live that long and some people to just go at 36 you know and I got lots of questions like that I, I remember when she had, a few years after she died uh, in the news Robert Mugabe had died and he lived you know way into his 90s and you go look why, why do you let that kind of thing happen? Why do you take someone? So I've got lots of questions like that, but I haven't got the answers for all those whys, but what is so important, what makes a difference is knowing who. I know that Jesus knows the answer to those questions, and I know that he loves me. I know that's why he came to this earth. I know that's why he went to the cross. I know he loves me, and um, that is good enough for me. It makes, it makes all the difference. Like I said, it, it, Jesus makes a difference now and he makes a difference forever.
Ryan, thank you so much for sh sharing so honestly. Um, I guess for what I've heard in, in your answers there is um, a, that God is a reality to you, not just some distant kind of figure. Um, for many people, God isn't that. They don't feel close to God. They feel he's distant, may, may not even believe in God. He, he's obviously someone very real to you. Um, what advice would you give to someone who might say, I wish I had your faith? I wish I knew God in the way that you seem to know him. What, what would you say to someone who longs to have the kind of certainty that you've just expressed, but, but doesn't have that at the moment? Yeah, yeah another great question, Rich. Um, I've got two bits of advice. Let me set that up first. Um, a few years ago, I was having a chat with a, with a bloke whose life had gone totally pear-shaped, belly up. It was, he would say himself, he just felt hopeless. And he gave me the opportunity to share some of this story with him. And it didn't happen just in one sitting like this. It, it was over time. And um, when I'd finished, I, and he was chewing over and we were asking questions of one another, he said something that really made my heart sink. And he didn't mean to. He, he wasn't trying to offend me. He wasn't trying to disappoint me. In fact, he meant it as a compliment. And he was being really sincere. This guy was desperate for hope. And the thing he said was, I wish I had your faith. I wish I had your faith. Um, and when I asked him about that, what he was saying was, um, I, he was saying, I know that I don't have what it takes to have that kind of relationship that you would have with God. As if it was some sort of skill that I was born with, some natural talent, that that's what my faith was. And um, the problem with that way of thinking, and I think a lot of people think that way, I've heard it lots of times, the problem with that is um, it puts the focus on me and my faith instead of Jesus, who is the object of my faith. He's the thing I lean on. I mean, don't get me wrong, faith is a wonderful thing, isn't it? I mean, all of us get by, you know, I'm having faith that this chair's gonna hold me up. You know, we all, we all exercise faith, but it's only as good as the object that you're putting it in. So my faith would be worth nothing if it wasn't in someone that I can trust. Um, to put it another way, give you a little illustration. Um, me and Sarah and the girls, we love walking down by the River Severn and um, we love to walk, walk both sides of the River Severn. And to do that, we get to the Diglis Bridge. And um, if you know the Diglis Bridge, it's a fairly new bridge. And when we walked across that bridge, none of us, not even my girls, expected to get a certificate or a medal or a cheer from someone, you know, well done. You, you know, you had the faith to cross the River Severn. Because if you've seen the Diglis Bridge, I mean, it, when someone crosses the Diglis Bridge, it's a testament to that bridge, how strong it is, not a testament to the faith. It takes some faith, but really nothing to walk across that bridge. And so my two pieces of advice are simply, when you've heard stories like this, maybe you've heard, a, maybe someone watching this has heard a story uh, a Christian tell another story that they found inspiring and um, first, my first bit of advice is don't look at me don't look at that person um, and here's a good reason sometimes my faith is really weak you know sometimes my faith really lets me down sometimes God feels distant from me as well and that's not because he's moved it's often because I've moved from him um, sometimes I fail him um, sometimes I doubt his goodness. Sometimes I forget all those wonderful things he taught me about himself when I was in that valley. But more often I remember them and I just choose to ignore them and think that I know better. Um, so yes, yeah, sometimes my faith is weak. Don't, don't look at me. My, my second piece of advice is simple. Look at Jesus you know, find out about Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way. You could say, I am the bridge, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. It's a bold thing for anyone to say, but not for the Son of God. You know, that's what he says. And um, you can bank on that. You know, Jesus, Easter Sunday reminds us that Jesus is he's not all words, he's actions. He's risen from the dead. And um, it, it means that if you look to Jesus, you're looking at someone who can give you uh, peace with God, who can forgive your sins, who can uh, 
give you the hope you need to get through anything in life and anything in death and beyond. Um, and, um, you know, perhaps right now you're watching this and, and you want a more immediate answer. Well, call out to Jesus, you know, ask him to forgive you your sins. Ask him to look after you and help you and guide you and carry you. He's, he's totally able to do that. And um, I, I don't want to do your job for you now, Rich, but if putting meat on the bones of that, I know that if folks come along to Wood Green Church, they're going to meet people who know this Jesus. They're going to hear about this Jesus. It's Jesus, Jesus, you know, and I, and I know you also do some Christianity Explored courses, and I, I think that would be a good way for people to find out more. Ryan, thank you so much for sharing so honestly with us. We are, we are so appreciative for all that you have shared with us. Um, and, and if you want to know more about what Ryan has been sharing with us, that hope for Easter, um, and for life, actually, then please do get in contact with us. Um, our email will be on screen at the end. We'd love to answer any questions you might have, but we'd particularly love to offer you a book, a free book called Finding More, which contains 11 stories similar to Ryan's from folk from different walks of life about how they have discovered hope um, in the midst of difficulties, but also just the normal um, uh, stuff of life. So please drop us a line if you'd like that. And here's a video that explains more about that. I grew up in a Hindu family and there was always the expectation as I was growing up that I would get a successful job. My partner and I had two kids and two successful businesses, so on the outside it looked like we had it all. My wife and I had separated, the economy had gone into recession, and I was thrown into this downward spiral of depression and redundancy. I was wild, I was doing loads of drugs, I was partying all day, and I was making loads of money. One evening my friend sent me a text saying, would you like to come to church with us? And I said yes. I knew I had to get my life together. And as I was reading this self-help book, I had this strange experience that I couldn't but help tell my Christian colleague about. My girlfriend started to go to church, came home and told me about this person called Jesus Christ. I thought, nah, leave it out, I'm having none of that. A friend of mine invited me to go to Christianity Explored uh, and I was reluctant initially, but eventually when I went, I was hooked. As I started reading Matthew's Gospel, it definitely had the ring of truth to it. It just didn't seem like it was made up. As I read the Bible, it was like it was alive. And it told me that my life was wrong. My friend asked me, are you ready to accept Jesus in your life? Do you believe that he died for you? And um, I said, yes. Jesus has given me more joy than I'd ever expected because I don't have to try hard or be good enough. Jesus has given me more peace when life is hard because I know he's in control. Jesus has given me more power to change than I would have ever expected. Thank you so much for watching Hope for Easter. Please do get in touch if you've got any questions or if we can help in any way. And if you'd like us to send you a free copy of Finding More, we'd be really happy to do that. Just drop us an email. As Ryan said, we also run Christianity Explored, a course for people who want to ask questions. Please do drop us a line if we can help you in any way. Why not take time this Easter to explore the hope Jesus offers? Have a great Easter.